Anyhow, uh, my name's Peter Berghammer, and uh, I write for a number of magazines. Um, some of them you may have heard of, some of them maybe not. Some are technical, some are consumer-oriented. I also provide uh, a lot of security hardware and software reviews, but those are always without bylines. Uh, some of the magazines I write for are, are DealerScope, which is primarily uh, for uh, retailers, dealers, distributors throughout the United States, and I handle corporate ethics, uh, security issues, things like that for them. Uh, Media Line, which goes to, uh, to studios. I write uh, a legal and studio uh, law and security column uh, that goes uh, with them. And then you can see they just go on and on and on. Additionally, I own a couple of different companies too, and, and I kind of enjoy it because it allows me to kind of sit at different places in the food chain when it comes to journalism and, and things like that. Um, the original company is Capernio. And it's not a pitch at all. It doesn't really apply to anything today. But we're aerospace and defense. Uh, we've been around for almost a decade now. And then future formats, we do CE research and analysis, uh, primarily for the big research, uh, for the big CE companies like Philips and Sony. So we do a lot of research in that area. And then we just recently launched uh, some VC-funded uh, uh, work going on there. So, you know, it's, it's rare on, on talks, and at least this is a nice intimate audience, so I don't have to worry too much. But the state of journalism today, it's always important, and I think especially at, at this one today, for me really to, uh, and, and we'll get to it a little later in the presentation, but it's kind of important for me to put these disclaimers up, that these are just my opinions. They, the magazines I write for have nothing at all to do with this whatsoever. Um, they could care less what I have to say, so I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. Um, they do care about what I write, however, so that's that always a problem. Um, it's just public commentary. It's uh, in no way an endorsement of anyone's products or non-endorsement if I criticize someone. Um, it's not legal advice, as long as we can be clear on that issue as well. Um, it's not ethical advice. I really, really don't care. And Although we'll come back to it, I have uh, in this last sentence, in today's world, these disclaimers are part of the business. And I think what we're beginning to see uh, as journalists, and I, and I see it, it's already happened to me, just so everyone knows that I'm speaking from firsthand experience, is uh, the pharmaceutical companies, for example, uh, last year already started suing a journalist who wrote things that are very, very critical of their products. Uh, one case that comes to mind is a sugar substitute known as Splenda. And, uh, you know, it, it's a, it was a fairly nasty little lawsuit. And, you know, I've, I've had my share too. And so I always put these in here that uh, this disclaimer is, is really just a casual talk for what it is here at DEF CON just to kind of have a good time and no pressure or anything else. But <clears throat> what probably is the oddest thing going on is that these terms that are banded around, all, you know, whether it's at Black Hat or at DEF CON, security and research, we all know what they mean. Uh, or at least we think we do, but when I talk to people and when I have, you know, uh, sources who contact me with breaches or, or notifications or things like that, there's a huge gray area and it seems to me that everyone has their own idea of what security means, what's, what research means. Also from my, my perspective, and it's not a fairly controversial statement, but I do actually, I, I've almost come to the opinion that the, the term hacking and, and the phrase hacker it has really become a very meaningless phrase. And, and I don't mean that as an affront to anyone here. It's just it means so many different things to so many different people. It encompasses so many different topics that it, it's really a, 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 almost a meaningless term because it means so much. <coughs> so on, on bullet point number two, with the pub publications and the website, security generally is meant to describe all the things related to a consumer's secure use of hardware and software. That's the big picture stuff, whether it's PC World or the LA Times or Contra Costa Times, those types of things. Generally, when we're referring to that, um, we're talking in the consumer world. However, on the, on, on the corporate world, security has a completely different context. So security research in this context also describes a company's best efforts to keep their products safe and secure. Now again, it doesn't mean much when you say best efforts, but best efforts is already a baseline gray area that can be exploited one way or the other. And we're going to take a, a couple of examples a little later in the talk and see what exactly is meant by best efforts. Uh, a security researcher though, meaning you guys in the audience, 
typically, and I think journalists like to portray you that way, you're kind of this lone mythic figure, maybe a loner working late at night, those types of things, and you're protecting us from harm, or you're causing us great harm. There's really not a, a lot of middle ground in between the two. So you're protecting us from all the stuff that the average consumer is really worried about, viruses, trojans, you name it, fishing, farming, email, even spam gets lumped, lumped into that whole thing. And it's really kind of a nice poetic notion uh, that journalists generally try to prevent or present about the hacking community in general. Now that's the white hat hackers. The black hat ha hackers, we just kind of flip all the terms over and turn you into crazy, maladjusted, maladapted individuals that are out to create malicious, malicious harm, you know, and vindictive harm. So. In, in, our, in our sense, at least, it's really unclear what we mean, now I'm speaking as a journalist, it's really unclear what we mean when we say this company is trying to keep a product safe and secure, this company is trying to keep this consumer's computer safe and secure. In other words, safe for who? The user or, and, and it's also probably a little more certain, protecting the company's intellectual property. And the same goes for research and researchers, you know, in the audience here. What are you researching? What are the ends? What are the means? And in whose best interests? If there are any best interests. Sometimes it's just the pursuit of the challenge, and it makes perfect sense to me. Before you have any conclusions reached today, though, about especially this uh, little one, safe for who, the user of the company's intellectual property, I really, really strongly suggest that you read the EULAs, you know, just for our the heck of it, read some of the EULAs accompanying and the click wrap and shrink wrap agreements that come with your software, you might really get a kick out of what's actually being asked of you uh, and what's being expected of you in the use. And you know, another question, I'm not going to go into it today because that's really a legal issue, but it, it concerns this whole changing notion of what ownership means, ownership of software, ownership of film, ownership of music. That whole concept has fundamentally shifted in the past, well, I'd say five years, but in particular in the past three years, that has so changed that the, the notion itself of owning a piece of software or owning a song, owning a film, is completely, completely different than it was a few years ago. Another issue that we sometimes confront <clears throat> are these terms of security and privacy, because security, privacy, they're, they're used interchangeably. It's almost in a sentence you could mix up the words and no one would really know the difference. No one would really question. Now, to this audience, I know you know the difference between security and privacy, but if you think in terms of the broader publications or TV shows that cover this type of stuff, these two terms are almost used interchangeably. However, <coughs> and I, I'll point that out again, they're, they're definitely not. Under no circumstances are they anywhere close to one another. Security refers to the core integrity of a communication. That's it, in this, not just in this context, but in general, point A to point B, the integrity, that core integrity of the communication, the assurance that that exists is what we mean when we're talking about security. You'd be amazed at how many people, in my profession at least, don't know that. It's, even for me, I find it kind of amusing. Privacy, however, it refers to the confidentiality of the sender. Even if the sender doesn't want to be anonymous or confidential, or the thing, because we're also talking about interactive devices like mice or, or DVD players or any of these types of things, the privacy still refers to the confidentiality of the sender. It therefore becomes the sender's choice whether or not they wish to be revealed or reveal their identity. Anonymity, uh, anonymity is a subset of privacy and cannot exist without security. So anonymity is kind of a cat all in its own. It falls under privacy, but it can't exist with the superstructure around it that's known as security. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry about that. Do you want to make a quick announcement in case someone has already found it? Yeah, you know, I heard a really interesting uh, chat from Symantec the other day, and, and 
uh, Andrew Lytle was his name, and he brought up a very interesting point. And I, uh, uh, first of all, I'm going to give him credit for having said this bullet point number one. But what I liked about it was very comprehensively summing up in plain English what privacy means. And it, 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 in his essence, and I really liked it quite a bit, it's meant just being left alone. It's being left to your own devices. Taking that a couple of steps further, really when you're seeing a misuse of privacy and security, what's really happening here at its, at its core is that there's a denial of personal autonomy. In other words, we're trying to manipulate you, we're trying to change you, we're trying to inf influence your actions, those types of things. In other words, you're not making your own decisions, you're being influenced to make those. I've heard a lot of uh, complaints today about the press. We'll come back to this point uh, on that one too. So in other words, the misuse of information is just used to manipulate. So if we're breaking down security into its simplest constituent parts, it, it really just comes down to identifying, codifying, and tracking communications. That, that's it. It may seem surprising to some of you that tracking actually falls into that, but we'll get also uh, onto that during the wrap-up. In other words, a device that has no connection to the wider world is of no interest whatsoever when we talk about security. So if you have a device that's not connected to anything on a network or connected to the internet or connected via a phone line or any number of issues uh, here or infrared or any of those things, it's really a moot point in what we're discussing. Now there is a little bit of debate on security if these, if some things like IRDA are enabled, to what degree this, this little sentence might change, but right now just for the simplest purposes, and I'm sorry to really be focusing on this, but uh, it's, kind of an, it's kind of an issue. So what we're saying is when we as journalists are talking about security, we really are discussing connected devices and, and the people that go with them generally on that one. The only exception to the rule, <clears throat> and there are a lot of films that deal with this type of stuff and it's very entertaining, uh, not always very truthful, but extremely entertaining, is when we're talking about personnel security. Because then there's the machine and the machine itself may not be connected whatsoever uh, to a network or anything along those lines, if you think Mission Impossible or along those. Uh, but it's connected to a person per se because a person has access and they enter the room, they leave the room, all that type of stuff. That's the only exception. But really, you know, that's really something for another talk because it's a very, very intriguing world in its own, uh, and it has its own subset of problems. The bad news at the start of the, of the talk today is that hackers and, and security researchers really aren't that different from journalists in their methodology. Now I know there's, I, I've heard a lot of things about the press today and if for anyone who uh, saw earlier the Dateline girl getting cha literally chased out of here by about 200 people, uh, <laughs> you know, I know the passions run very, very high. But the methodology, the way hackers conduct their research or security researchers conduct their research because those two terms themselves aren't interchangeable, really doesn't differ that much from how we conduct our business as well. Um, sometimes we, li re we uh, rely on the same stealth or subterfuge that a hacker might. Sometimes we're really relying on the paper trail, the documentation, all those types of things in the same fashion that a, a legitimate security researcher might. And we face exactly the same problems that a security researcher or a hacker faces when it comes to exposing the information that we suddenly come upon or that we're able to, uh, that we want to print. Sometimes uh, we can't print it. Um, in the same way that a security researcher is unable, because of at least the full disclosure ethic, unable to do anything with the information they have until they've given the company a chance to rectify that issue. So all flavors of these terms really have a lot more uh, profound issues. And security, and this is what I really enjoy when I go to the black hats, you know, and the DEF CONs, there's so many times where it really exists, this, this whole notion of, of autonomy, uh, anonymity, security, all these types of things, they exist in a very abstract and theoretical sense, and yet they're tied down because of the code. They're tied down, and, and they really take a good view towards the day-to-day -day implications of what happens, what does this mean? So for example, if your flash file, and, and no offense to flash, because flash is a very, has a very, very secure security model in, in that respect, but if, if you have a flash file and you're able to corrupt it in a fashion, that's what you guys do. And what I do is I take a look at what happens, what are the implications of that? And, and there's a lot of music encoding work being done right now that's extremely fascinating. And we're going to talk about it from the other angle a bit later when it comes to the corporate abuse of, of 
those types of viruses, those types of worms. The other thing that I really find fascinating when I come here is that it almost always involves an intimate familiarity with the intricacies of the machine hardware, the patterns, the predictability, and a host of other topics. But it's, it's a lot uh, similar to another area that's really dear to my heart is physics. I, I really like this whole, this whole concept of the science behind what's being done because like it or not, it's an art, but it's also a science. So, yeah, on the one hand, we have security researchers who are looking at it from the highly abstract, the theoretical sense, the, the advanced analytic sense. That's what, that's what, you know, quite honestly, you know, if we ever wind up chatting, that's kind of what floats my boat. You know, that's what I like to write about in, in those areas. But really, there's another issue that's starting to take shape, and that's, again, where hackers and, and security researchers start to have other parallels with journalists. And, and that's who are you working for? Who are you retained by? Who do you report to? That's a very, very interesting question, um, ultimately. Because in the same sense that a scientist might conduct research, you know, as, as a journalist, when I look at people who come to me with uh, flaws or, or, or other exposed type uh, things or issues, you always kind of have to look at the motivations for doing that. You know, is it a purely altruistic thing? You know, earlier we referred to this Homeric notion of the hacker as someone who just very poetically is out altruistically protecting the rights, the security of our communications. Okay, now I'm talking about the white hats. I really like that concept, but you know, then it gets a little compromised when you start thinking about, okay, who are they working for? What are they doing? What's the real motive here? That's my job, is to actually figure that out, the, and, and my colleagues. I mean, we try to figure that out all the time. This is also one of the reasons we don't talk to PR people very much, because the PR people, they spin a very good tale, but it's not necessarily what works for us or what's going to work for the article or the magazine or even our reader base. The other thing that's, that's a little interesting, and it's the flip side of the coin, is the dark hat researcher, the, the hacker, I guess is what we'll use it for lack of a better term at the moment. Maybe they don't have any oversight. Maybe they're just out exploiting you know, vulnerabilities and those types of things. To our way of thinking, when we're writing articles or when we're, we're researching vulnerabilities in articles or we're even more importantly researching the lack of a corporate response to a vulnerability, it's not always an advantage that you're a dark hat when we get this information. And a lot of times I, I'm not sure that people understand that from a journalist perspective at least, you know, we have kind of a chain of evidence that we have to preserve or a chain of evidence that we have to adhere to if you work for a good publication, they're going to request that and require the, the paper trail. But more importantly, it's good to get the tips from the dark hats, but that verification trail sometimes is non-existent. So you know you've got a story, but there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And you know, I mentioned earlier journalists getting sued, and I really would be surprised if in 2008, 2009, we don't start seeing that. In, and it's probably a good thing for the EFF to hear too, but I would be extremely surprised if we didn't find product reviewers and security reviewers on the journalist side who weren't on the receiving end of some types of lawsuits, either to shut them up or to sue them for lost profits. And believe me, I'm a big fan of security companies. I'm not even implying that the security company has any intention of suing. It, it could be something completely different. But it's something to bear in mind that this chain of custody, this chain of evidence is a very important thing for us. Now, the other problem in the security arena is that there's just such a vast number of types of journalists who cover this whole thing. And there are just a vast number of publications and, and television shows that cover this type of stuff. I'd mentioned Dateline uh, NBC earlier. Okay, I think we can safely assume it probably was going to be something a little more sensationalistic about the show uh, here, something a little darker, something a little more titillating, I guess is what you'd say. But you know, you also have people who have vested interests and advertisers, which is very important for magazines in particular and websites, you know, whose products, so for example, a Bank of America might be very, very happy if you're going to be covering the security area because B of A actually advertises on the site or in the magazine that you write for, and you, you know, are kind of hyping their security methods by association only. Okay? So it's just something to bear in mind with journalists. The good ones don't do that, but as I'd mentioned, there are all sorts of types of journalist magazines and uh, that type of stuff. Other types of journalists love the, t the really sensationalistic stuff like 
when DOD loses a laptop or, or the Department of Veterans Affairs loses a laptop, uh, we're going to talk about TJ Maxx in a little while, when they get hacked and uh, credit card numbers are exposed and, and that it makes such a great story. Uh, people love that stuff. It speaks to all the core values that Americans who read that type of press really get a kick out of, you know, an inept government, poor security policies, breaking the law, uh, because there are laws governing encryption and, and how data should be stored on laptops and those types of things. So we really, really like that kind of stuff, and there are a number of journalists who like to cover it. I'm not sure that it does any, and this is just a personal opinion, so, you know, again, I'm not sure it does anyone any favors in the security industry, that type of coverage. Um, you know, it, quite frankly, I'm not sure that anyone benefits. It's just a give me story. People read it um, because it's, it's just as good as a dog bites man type story. But it's something to bear in mind. There are other people who cover things, and I earlier referred to it as the art of security and the ethical implications of what you do. So whether you're a corporate researcher or a black hatter or those types of things, it's kind of a very, very interesting little area that there's a subset of journalists who are tremendously intelligent and hardworking, very, very diligent at what they do, who love to cover this type of stuff. They love to, to expose you know, security breaches that there's been a corporation that's attempted to cover them up. It, it's a good read, it's a good story, it's good technology generally, very, very interesting stuff. And I know one or two guys, and you know, that's always a personal choice, um, who actively work with black hats in order to open up security uh, concerns, where I don't want to say they're soliciting it, uh, but perhaps encouraging it. Um, the lines of legality on that one, I'm, I'm completely unclear of, and it's, it's not that I'm stupid, it's just that it's a really wide open area um, in that. <clears throat> And, you know, as a general rule of thumb, and this applies to most of the journalists in the CE uh, space as well, the consumer electronics area, in the security area, they're actually pretty well versed in what they do. Some of them actually had corporate jobs, got tired of it, and decided that, yeah, at a couple hundred bucks an article, I'll write this and everything's going to be fine and I'm still connected but I'm semi-retired and those types of things. I find them, for, by and large, you know, extremely competent, really not that compromised by corporate concerns, which is really a, a breath of fresh air. Um, and I think in parentheses there, I said most of them are underpaid. So realize myself is an exception, but I don't accept money for the articles I write. Um, uh, most of them really don't get nearly as much money as they deserve for the hard work they do and for the, the service to the industry on both sides of the fence uh, that they do. And I, I, you know, there's not much we can do about that. There's generally a difference, you know, and I, I realize I'm covering a lot of uh, semi-obvious ground for you guys, but we'll go over this in, and until we get to the more interesting stuff, I guess. But there is generally a difference between a printed publication and a website. And what's really interesting to me right now is that a lot of publications, you know, big, big publications that you all read at least once a week, you know, or at least once a month when it comes out, they're having a lot of trouble with their websites. They can do, it seems they can do one really well, but not the other. So the ones that are doing really great publications are having a little bit of trouble with the traction on the website. They're not getting the types of numbers they want or those types of things. Or what they're finding is that their print publication readers are actually going to their website, looking for a very specific topic, term, or product, and then leaving again. There's absolutely no traction whatsoever. I think it's, it's an interesting one. It's an area that deserves a lot of analysis um, simply because no one's really sure why it's happening. I mean, so many fixes have been tried, um, you know, whether it's design or communities or the creation of networks. None of it's really worked right now. So there is still, to this day, in the minds of consumers um, and, and technical people in particular, a real good understanding that there's a big difference between a publication and a website. Now, what's really interesting about that is it used to be that the printed word had you could kind of go to the Washington Post or PC World, you know, the, the real standby great publications that you would get a depth of analysis uh, and, and an understanding and more importantly kind of a breadth of information that you wouldn't be able to get on something like a blog. Now things have changed considerably now and what's really odd, um, but in a good way odd, is that blogs are actually driving most of the research and blogs are really driving most of the security concerns on the internet and in this community, our community, as well. 
Um, the print publications do a really good job. It's just they're coming up a little bit short, and I think it's that timeliness factor that may have something to do with it. You know, also the profitability section of the whole thing really makes a very, very big difference. And there's you know a lot lower overhead when you're operating a website, and it has really, really profound implications for advertisers, and also this whole notion of double checking content. And uh, you know, it's just, even though I'm going to mention PC World yet one more time, I, I don't work for them, so uh, there's no reason for that. I'm just using them as a kind of a paragon of, of a really good publication. Um, what's interesting for anyone who follows this whole beat in the consumer electronics software hardware arena, about two months ago, uh, a new head of the publication came on board. And for outward, outward appearances, it would seem that he attempted to get the editor, Harry McCracken, to alter some of the stories based on good advertising from Apple and, and other types of, of things. That's something that is absolutely unprecedented at top level publications, at most pu top level publications. What's interesting is that Harry says, you know what, I'm out of here. And I know Harry personally, he's a guy of, of tremendous integrity. And I mean, he just quit. And that was that. He had a job at noon. And at five o'clock, he's already he'd already been gone for an hour or so. Now, there's probably a little bit more, you know, to the story. But what happened is that within 48 hours, he was back at his post. There was such an uproar, um, and people found it just so tasteless that there was this whole pay-for-play uh, mentality going on that product reviews could actually be altered based on what an advertiser wanted. That it really sent a strong message, and I, I hope. If you take anything away from the talk, you know, look for journalists that are like that, because it, it, it's rare, but it's absolutely the most critical thing. And I mean, even though he's not here, he deserves an enormous amount of uh, credit. Well, now I'm going to talk about the more serious journalists, the guys who take their profession pretty seriously, and also see the broader implications of, of what you do and why it's so important. And we don't just see it as a question of security. We also see it as a matter of law. And you know, thankfully, we've had EFF here you know, actually throughout this week. And the, we have a lot of the feds. We have a, a lot of very interesting people, lawyers, attorneys. Um, it's almost as important right now. And it, when you go to Black Hat and you go to DEF CON, it's very interesting to me that the legal aspects and the legal implications of the work you do are as well attended as, as the seminars on what you do. And that's, that's a fascinating comment on how interrelated it is. You know, we also, and, and myself in particular, since I write a couple of international columns, I see this as a, a really important area of politics. Uh, the geopolitics of security is actually the great untapped story, actually, of any security convention. Um, that's the one that's probably the most interesting, the most intriguing story I've come across in over a decade. Um, and we'll get to it a little bit with Blu-ray and HD DVD and, and uh, HDCP and HDMI and all those types of issues a little later. But this whole notion of geopolitics in the security arena and the, and the notion of geopolitics and privacy is an absolutely rich area. It, it probably just deserves more of a movie than it deserves an article, I would, I would think. And then, of course, economics. It's, economics really is, is going to be one of the driving factors. Most of the time, when we look at these issues, what we're seeing is that those very same issues revolve around personal freedom, your right to do and see and say what you want to say, censorship, and constitutional law. Uh, it it's almost always has something at its core that deals with these issues. And then at an even deeper issue, it, it deals with the complexities you know, that we talked about earlier with privacy, but also on things like cryptography and cryptography's role um, in guaranteeing your freedom of expression, guaranteeing your freedom of research, and the implications of what that means. And at its core, a journalist's view of security colors the approach to the above topics. So if you get a journalist who thinks it's just a really great story that a kid, you know, a little kiddie scripter wrote an Outlook script and infected millions of, of mailboxes around the world without looking at the broader implications, fine. That's the kind of story you're going to get. But it, you also get journalists who really are looking at the deeper things, why it means so much. And I think at some level, and I've been to DEF CON a number of years now, I, I think at some deeper level, you know, those on the white hat and the black hat sides also understand that they just don't, uh, they're sometimes just looking at it from the perspective of what happens if I get caught. 
That's why I need to you know, talk or attend these, these legal things. That's why I need to go hear from the EFF. It's much more than that. I think at a deeper level, there's actually a very fundamental understanding that a real service, even on the, on the dark hat side, a real service is being provided, albeit in obscure ways, but a very, very real service. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, security bloggers are really now the mainstay of serious security research. That ability to log on morning, noon, or night and actually get adequate, literally up to the minute reporting on security flaws, exploits, vulnerabilities, viruses, you name it, is really, really a very, very important feature. And for that, print journalists such as myself, we, pr we play no role whatsoever. So by extension already, we're kind of missing out on what I think is one of the most interesting and, and most timely portions of this. And again, it refers to that, the timeliness and the intensity of near real-time reporting just can't be beat. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how you could do your jobs without having that resource. It is hoped, but it's not always true, but it's hoped that print journalists can still bring a better analytical and, and, and deeper cross-related events to bear on any type of issue that's out there. That's really where this whole breakout between blogging and, and print is headed, is that there is an attempt, and eWeek, for example, does it very, very well, you know, um, where there's a depth of reporting that uh, they're able to accomplish that just can't be done on a blog. So it's a very interesting little mix-up as far as that goes. The sentence, the sentence at the end is, is kind of an awkward one because it says, in some very few cases, however, print can be compromised by the very audience it seeks to reach. I would be lying if I told you that when I write articles, I get a lot of pressure back, um, not from my publications, not from the editors or even the advertisers. I've, in knock on wood, I've never ever had an advertiser call me demanding I make a retraction or a change or anything like that and I've never had an editor call me for a retraction or a change based on something that an advertiser wanted. So I, I'm hoping it speaks well to the choices of publications that, that I chose. But by the same token, I get a lot of email uh, from people who are really pissed at something I may have written. Um, and I have to be sensitive. I have to be very, very sensitive to that audience. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but the fact that it's even a concern is something that I find really interesting. And although you know, in the best of all possible worlds, I'd love to say I haven't been compromised, the fact of the matter is with core readership that is very good at showing you know, their opinions or expressing themselves, you're not compromised, but you take it into account in the future. And it's, it's kind of that balance between finding what's relevant and meaningful and uh, staying the course. So it's compromised may be just uh, too harsh of a word. So let's just look at some of the top stories of the past year and why they got you know, the coverage they did. The top two stories until, well, actually I should say the first story I, I've written nothing about in any publication. The second story I have uh, an article coming out actually next month about some aspects of, of the TJ credit card, uh, TJ Maxx credit card fiasco. Sony uh, and HP both uh, uh, are interesting stories in that after those were published, those uh, articles were published, I suddenly was uh, denied access uh, to those companies. And you know, I used to fly to Tokyo pretty regularly, especially to the research labs. And, uh, that's all changed. I picked up another magazine. Now they need me again. So, in other words, journalists are pretty expendable. And that's probably, as long as you realize that it, it's probably not such a bad thing. But, I th you know, again, we talked earlier about uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs and DOD. I mean, we love these stories because it really points to this overall perception that the government would like to regulate every single thing they do, and yet they can't even keep, a, you know, keep hold of a laptop. Uh, it, it's an unfair characterization, quite frankly. I mean, laptops are lost every day, and I have no doubts that laptops, knock on wood for everyone, but that laptops will be lost here at DEF CON. But just something to bear in mind, that it's just a good story. It's, is it relevant? No. Is the follow-up on this, how, it, how the problems rectified, fixed, and, and uh, amends are made? That's really where the story is uh, on something like that. The TJ Maxx one is very, very interesting insofar as not only does it point to extremely poor security, you know, if anyone here uh, from TJ Maxx, feel free to contact me afterwards, but uh, extremely poor security, internal security policies, but 
the real story, to my opinion, had nothing to do whatsoever about hacking. The real story actually happened with once those cards were compromised and the numbers uh, were cloned onto new cards and people were out spending and, and, and running up the limits on all this and millions and millions and millions of individual numbers. The problems TJ Maxx actually encountered with the banks who wanted some money back because they felt that rightly that TJ Maxx was at fault. The banks actually wanted some of that money back for all the money that they had lost. Because a very interesting legal issue and a very legal argument because there are very few laws, believe it or not, that actually govern the transactions between stores like or large corporations like TJ Maxx and banks. And you would think of all the people not to have a regulation governing getting money, it would be a bank. So, you know, again, it was kind of a peripheral story that was very interesting. You know, likewise with the Sony rootkit fiasco, I'm not sure that the story itself um, solely had something to do with an attempted install and in some cases an actual install of a rootkit onto users' software to monitor their actions. It's just an incredible, an, an incredible breach of trust and, and confidence in that. But the inability of Sony, and I really like Sony a lot anyhow, I mean they're a really great company and I personally know a lot of guys there, but that problem of communication and, and dealing with the issue to begin with and the fact that they let it escalate to the point where state's attorney general were going after them for what they did. And then finally the denial on the part of my community and, and your community to some extent, but a much lesser extent, of the fact that what they did is no different than what a dark hat does is really quite amazing to me. And it's this whole corporate malfeasance, and I don't mean to imply that, I mean, in, in Sony's case, it, it, I, I'm not even sure I could say there's corporate malfeasance per se, but this whole appearance of corporate malfeasance is really an amazing issue that, again, you know, earned it the word fiasco. And since we're on the topic of malfeasance, this whole HP spying and spoofing thing, although you would think it's not related to what you do, it actually speaks volumes about the perceptions of the average reader and the, and the general reading public about what they think of the computer industry in general. And I tell you, if, if my reader base is anything, and it's in, you know, I don't know, almost 500,000 a week, if it's any uh, indication, I mean, most of my readers feel that HP got off very, very easy. That if you had done exactly the same thing, whether it was on the Sony case or the HP case, the, the repercussions would have been significantly different, and you would have done time. It's simple as that. You would have done time. The difference, oh, you can't afford lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's where places where EFF comes in and those types of groups, so it, it becomes a very fascinating one. I think the five biggest, and here I get to say it, I guess, but the five biggest fuck-ups are where we really miss the point um, completely. And when I say miss the point completely, I mean that there was reporting on all of these stories here. If you want it, you can find it. There's no shortage of, of any of these issues. But where we really got it wrong are what the implications are about. And where we really got it wrong is what it means for us, um, you know, operating at least in a constitutional democracy, in the United States at least, what it means that these stories really weren't given any broader context. And I think that's a real tragedy. So when I say the five biggest fuck-ups, I think I might want to amend that to the five largest missed opportunities to assert everything that's really great about the industry, about the country, about all these types of things. And, and this is where we missed it, you know, and, and some are maybe a little controversial, but we'll, we'll go from there. The censorship issue uh, in Google, with Google, for example, in China, and, and again, you know, I'm not picking on these companies. I really like them and I know a lot of people there and really good companies. Everyone named on this, uh, with one exception, is a really great company. Um, but the fact that we missed what it meant for an American company to engage in censorship at the behest of a foreign government, even though they're doing business there, is really an interesting uh, contradiction. I'm not sure we as journalists did a very good job on that one, quite honestly. And there's some part of me that actually kind of wistfully wishes that some, in, th in this case, since it involves China, that some dissident uh, group didn't sue one of these companies on behalf of the very principles we espouse here in, in this country. And it's just uh, a personal observation. I think another story that gets misreported or, because there's a lot of pizzazz there, it gets misreported a little bit, is what the uh, Recording Industry Association of America is doing. 
And again, you know, it's a free country. They're f freely entitled to do what they do. Um, they're a trade organization. They collect licensing fees, royalties, whatever you want to call them. Okay, that's their right to do this isn't what's in dispute. But I think there are some issues here that are beginning to emerge that are really becoming kind of worrying. Now, most of the press stories on the RIAA are actually really great stories about either abuses of the legal process in order to bring people to trial, or in some cases, because now it's this, this uh, edifice, I guess, is beginning to crack a little bit, people are starting, to, or at least one right now, has started to win lawsuits against the RIAA. So it's a very interesting and it's a great story. I mean, no matter how you slice it. Now, within the last 24 hours, there's a little virus that came out known as W32.delete music. For all intents and purposes, it's a USB shared virus. That doesn't mean much in and of itself. But uh, what it does is it actually systematically searches your hard drive, looks for MP3 files, and deletes them. Now, the conventional wisdom is pretty simple, which is, you know, some prankster out there decided, okay, wouldn't this be funny? We're going to go do this. We're going to create this worm. We're going to do that. And I, you know, I probably shouldn't have put it under the whole RIAA thing, but I do want to point to one other fact about music files and, and film clip files and those types of things, which is they're so promiscuous, I think is the phrase I've heard not too long ago. They're everywhere. Everyone's got them on their computers. Everyone shares them. Everyone sends links. It's really the type of file format that just knows no bounds. Now, let's, let's take these two things together and, and weave a, a, a slight conspiracy theory a little bit here, which is, are we beginning, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form, just so I can be really clear that the RIAA has anything whatsoever to do with W32 delete music, right? In fact, I'm guessing more than likely not. I can't say that categorically, it's just the worm's too new. But what's kind of interesting is, are we now starting to see this whole concept of the abuse of, for example, uh, intensive sharing networks, uh, social networks, as a, as a potential opening for corporate abuse? The only thing that's interesting in that whole bullet point there is the fact that W32 delete music, yeah, I, I think everyone, I'm hoping everyone in the room would believe that the RIA wouldn't do that. But is there any doubt somewhere maybe that it could be accomplished by the RIA. Now that's a question, it's a leading question. I don't mean to put any wrong ideas in your head. But then when you start looking at other outside facts, you know, the RIA was extremely aggressive in California when it came to lob lobbying to prevent certain electronic surveillance laws from being implemented last year. Extremely active. I wrote about that. I got a lot of nasty letters, uh, well, pretty much from the RIA. But you know, nonetheless, um, why would they be opposing any electronic intrusion type legislation? Again, I, these are just open questions. I'm a journalist, so these are the types of questions I ask. Now, are any of these three things fitting together? Absolutely not. Not yet. I'm just saying that this is where kind of the genesis of articles get started. Next thing, I just want to briefly refer to, because there hasn't been enough work done on this issue, is, is the Vista phone home uh, issues. And I'm, I'm really getting more and more concerned on this whole concept. And, and, you know, Intel is also working on a nice little chip, a nice little chipset and actually operation set so that when we leave our computers on, everything can be monitored and updated in, in a good way, in a, in a, in a paternalistic fashion. Um, I say that very, very cautiously because I think these are issues that, even though they're stated in the EULA, they're really not considered by people who are buying the operating systems or the chips. They're really not thinking about this stuff, what it actually means. And it's a very interesting one. Now, Blu-ray, HD, DVD, uh, I'm just going to focus on those two really quickly because, again, an extremely interesting problem there with the phone home features. Uh, you know, Blu-ray more so than HD, DVD, and I know these two very, very intimately. But I'm really concerned, again, about the web interactivity that exists there, and in general with consumer devices, even, even Sansa-type you know, stuff. 
I'm really, really worried about what it means to phone home. What does it mean to actually have turn off, turn off, key, uh, turn on, turn off keys? To authorize and deauthorize players? To deauthorize a player for playing illegal content? So, for example, if you bootlegged the latest Pirates of the Caribbean, there is the potential that your Blu-ray player would be shut down for playing illegal content, bootleg content. How would they know? More importantly, and you know, this is where it comes back to the geopolitics of the whole problem, where I get very, very interested. Where is the databases? Where are they residing? Are they residing in Burbank? Are they residing in Tokyo? Are they residing in Malaysia? Where, where are these databases? And, and what information are they collecting? What information, for example, in my viewing habits, I'm not much of a TV guy, but I do watch, what information on my viewing habits is actually being sent where, right? Is a, it's just a fundamental question. To what end? And you know, there's an interesting group in San Francisco right now called the Tension Trust. Uh, I think it's uh, Seth Goldstein who's uh, the founder and put it together. A really, really interesting group who's actually tackling this problem from a slightly different angle. And he's tackling it from the web browser perspective, which says, you know what? I've got all these damn cookies. I'm visiting all these damn sites. You know, people are trying to track my movements all the time. I'm going to claim ownership of my cookies. I'm going to store all my view data on my own, both on my hard drive and at one of Attention Trust partners, um, partner companies, for example, Attention Bank. It's a very interesting concept because really where they're coming from is saying, wait a minute, double click, soon to be Google if, if the FTC doesn't have too many issues. Wait a minute. That's none of your business. I own my attention span. I own my attention stream. I sh and, uh, by implication, it's, and I should be able to monetize it. And I think that's the big fear of this whole thing. And that's going to bring us to metadata, meta mining, and metadata repurposing. <clears throat> the fundamental aspects impacting freedom of expression, I think, really have to be looked at here when it comes to metadata. And, in the interest of full disclosure, I did mention I own a VC firm too. You know, we invest in a lot of meta metadata companies. Um, that seems to be a Web 2.0 metadata type uh, groups, um, all startups, um, all with extremely complex, very interesting uh, skill sets. So you have to, you know, understand that. But as someone who writes and as someone who speaks, I also have an obligation to kind of look at this this issue a little more critically, and and take a look at what are the implications for metadata. Uh, what does it mean on meta mining, uh, which is essentially data mining of all the metadata, and metadata repurposing. In other words, the ability to extract the information from meta mining and represent that information to you in a new fashion or perhaps a new website or perhaps a new introduction to a clothing company or things like that. What exactly is going on? Now, yeah, it's sort of borderline advertising. What's interesting about it, though, is that advertising is a, is a pretty open concept. It's one that we understand. We watch movies and we see a can of Coca-Cola. We understand that that's a product placement for which they pay good money. Right? Very rarely do you see product placements that aren't paid for in movies, and, and more so now every time in, in film. But on the web, that's not always very, very apparent. So what, what's going on with this metadata thing, and why is it so important? Well, the first one is you would think, and I think most people assume, especially when they see double-click cookies on, inside their browsers and that type of stuff, that just their current actions are, are being tracked, right? They're being monitored, they're reporting back on. You know, if you're like me, you probably don't have that much that you'd be ashamed of. I mean, you know, in my case, it would be like looking at Chrysler's, you know, because my whole family likes German cars. So I, I, it's not a big problem for me. But <clears throat> the metadata people are, you know, are really looking at retaining this information for a really, 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 really long time. And when I say really, I think I wrote in here forever. All right? I think it's time as professionals on the security side, the legal side in particular, that we, you know, really take a good hard look again at re-examining the linkability or the unlinkability between this, this clickstream, this what, what it really is called transactions. I think we need to take a good hard look at data retention policies. And you'll see at the bottom I say that data retention threatens privacy. And you know, I'll give some examples. And again, neutral examples is just a, kind of a, a, a par for the course type example. But in the last California election, 
Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, really, although he has all these great futuristic films, you're not always thinking in terms of the, the sophistication that goes into getting reelected. And what I found really, really interesting for him is that through meta mining in particular um, and, and data mining, that the Republican National Committee actually got very, very good demographics on what what Republicans like to drink, what they like to drive, you know, as a whole. And correspondingly, then they would buy mailing lists, for example, from Coca-Cola, you know. So you would think it's a random thing for Arnold Schwarzenegger to send out hundreds of thousands of mailers just to Coca-Cola drinkers, but statistically it made a hell of a lot of sense. And this is the scary part, that linkage that's going on, and I haven't seen too many companies, I mean, obviously, the big exception is a company like DoubleClick. But I haven't seen a lot of startups out there that are actually saying, hey, wait a minute, we can approach this whole metadata, meta mining issue. And then if you start thinking of the internationality of the internet itself, it becomes a really big problem because this whole concept of metadata, meta mining, and, and uh, repurposing of metadata really flies into the face, for example, of a lot of European law. You know, this data retention policy, this, this retention policy of forever really becomes a very big issue. And uh, I'm only going to talk just very briefly on this slide. I'm going to jump to the near the last slide and then uh, unfortunately we have to call this a day. Or fortunately, uh, since it's uh, Las Vegas. Um, I just want to talk about some of the underreported stories or should be reported stories um, out there right now. Some are positive, some are negative. I really think that uh, this whole concept of WikiLeaks and authorized signature chains for initiating um, leaks, verifiable leaks from verifiable sources is something that is completely undervalued. I, I really think the work that's being done in this area, please just you know, do a Google search on, on WikiLeaks or, or RSTs. You, you might be very, very pleasantly surprised. Likewise, I think you might find it interesting that Apple is on there because they're probably one of the most overreported companies in, in the country. The thing I find so interesting about the Apple issue, though, is you know, outside of, of Black Hat and DEF CON, we really don't hear that much about Apple security. Um, we do in some of the publications. eWeek's a good example. Um, even PC World you know, Monthly will carry some good stuff on that. But I'm not sure that the complexity of the environment we operate in today is actually being done justice. And I really like Apple, too. I mean, it's another great company. But I'm not sure that their approach is, is the approach that we all want to hold up posters about. Um, I really would urge you all, because I know we're coming to the end of the talk, to really go spend a little bit of time taking a closer look at electronic voting. And bear in mind this whole concept of paper verified voting trails, meaning you get a receipt for what you voted for at the end of your session. Um, this is a company, Acupol, um, and I'm only going to mention very, very briefly I had. It's a company that's now out of business. They're long gone, about a year and a half ago. Um, but they had actually a pretty good machine, and you couldn't even open it. I mean, it was it was a very nice little deal. Obviously, they went out of, we have two minutes, they went out of business because they uh, had a really good machine. What's interesting to me, though, is the executives uh, that actually were willing to talk to me at the end of their life cycle. And, you know, a couple of them had mentioned that they'd gone to some states in which they were disapproved in order to pitch their product. They were disapproved because the state itself was concerned that if they used AccuPoll machines, the vote might not come out right. And that's a quote. And that's a shocking thing when you think about that. Web 2.0 vulnerabilities, I, I'm hoping here there's also going to be something on OpenID. I think it's something you need to take a really good uh, look at. Great product, also great vulnerabilities. And please, although I, I, I don't know him personally, um, I did want to talk a little bit about Estonia and those types of things. We're running out of time. But uh, please make the point of attending that talk. And uh, I want you to think just about two things in particular. One is this whole concept of the blogosphere actually influencing political actions and negative political actions in, in the case of Estonia. I think it's you know, providing instructions on how to flood servers, you know, those types of things. I think it's something very interesting. And I'll just conclude because we're only a portion of the way through here. What would happen, and this is a theoretical question to conclude, but what would actually happen if we saw cyber attacks on candidates' websites in this election cycle? It's a highly theoretical question, but just think about it maybe. You guys are the experts. You guys are the pros. 
What would happen if, if a Rudy Giuliani's website was hacked? Would that actually be a plus for him since he, his platform is terrorism? What would happen you know, to these candidates if we saw that type of stuff? And what would happen if we saw this new term as a political activity, which is blogosphere memeing? You know, coordinated political action, coordinated through blogs in order to disrupt a system. I think it's very interesting. I thank you all for your time and uh, have a fun evening as well. So.